thank you everyone for joining the 10,000 minute ML lecture. Uh, my name is Varsha, I'm from Griatim. And uh, we have Ishan Jain, who's our mentor for today, and he'll be teaching us about clustering algorithms. So just giving a small uh, introduction, Ishan Jain is a senior data scientist at Walmart Labs. Uh, he's into the supply chain analytics team. And he has over eight years of hands-on data science experience and has previously worked with uh, Low Homes Improvement, Dell, uh, Absolute Data Analytics. Uh, he has completed his BTEC from IIT Roorkee and is a self-taught data scientist who believes in learning by doing. That's also the motive of Griatum, no doubt. And uh, outside work, he plays uh, table tennis, badminton, and is trying to master drums these days. So I think people who are interested for data scientist stuff as well as post all of this, please connect with him on LinkedIn as well. I'm sure he has a lot of great things to teach. So I'm um, just handing it over to Ishan. Uh, just a few things. You can keep uh, the chat option, as in use the chat option wisely. Uh, I think Ishan will guide us through how he wants to take the session, either I, mostly questions at the end. And uh, I would like you guys to help us with your feedback. At the end of the session, I'll be sharing the feedback from in between once or twice. And, uh, Keep the questions regarding the session. Anything apart from session regarding Grey Atom, you can get in touch with me or our admissions team. Or and anything that you'd like to learn from Ishan, please get in touch with him as well. Thank you. Over to you, Ishan. I'll just unmute you. Just a second. Yeah. Here you go. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for this wonderful introduction, Visha. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hope you could hear me OK. So. Uh, let me introduce a little bit more about myself. So yes, I have been working uh, in data science field for the last eight years. Uh, mostly I have worked uh, on the retail side. I, the retail is very much dynamic and I like uh, the domain because of that. There are so many problems which are unexplored right now. So it's always excites you, uh, but uh, no offense to other domains. Okay, cool. So uh, what is that we are going to uh, learn today? So let me set up some other expectations. Uh, so, material will be shared at the last, right? So, don't need to take too many notes. It's rather better if you could get your intuition correct about the techniques. Uh, remember slide numbers uh, for your questions. I might not answer all the questions uh, if you are posting it on chat during the uh, webinar because that question might not be relevant for many others. So, it's better to cover the complete content. And then we could definitely open for questions. And I'll be more than happy uh, both during the webinar and after the webinar to help you on the questions. OK. Now, uh, so today, we are going to cover these many things. OK. I already shared this in the uh, earlier um, article that uh, Varsha shared. So we are going to start as in how data scientists actually think about a machine learning problem when they come to them. So what's the framework? Okay, then definitely machine learning. Uh, many of us know, right? Machine learning could be divided into certain categories. Unsupervised machine learning is a little bit untouched, so we are going to talk about that. Okay, unsupervised machine learning is not only clustering, so we will try to see what other things are there. Okay, then we will try to understand what's the intuition behind clustering. Okay, and why do we need to do clustering at first place? Okay, so that's another thing. Then we are going to talk about different kind of clustering techniques. Okay, so. Uh, clustering techniques, uh, as soon as the name comes up, and if a person is uh, not uh, very much experienced, and many times it's always about k-means clustering or hierarchical clustering, but let's try to see what other clustering techniques are available. And I'll help you out to develop a good intuition how those techniques work. I'll also try to give you some pointers and as in what are the advantages and disadvantages of using those particular techniques. So that the next time you uh, come up with a clustering problem, you would be able to take a very good head start on that problem I mean, because you will know what all tools do you have and what needs to be tested out. Okay, so it's always a, it's always about trying different models, right? But if you don't know what models to try, then uh, come on, you cannot do uh, really great on that thing. We will also talk about industry use cases. Okay. And I have uh, prepared, tried to prepare a really good Python notebook. Uh, if you could see my screen here, we have the clustering health algorithms. These are the different algorithms that I have covered for you. Uh, it has both simulated data, 
as well as some of the data from Kaggle and industry use cases. So we will try to run through it. I might not be able to run all the code because um, it takes time. So I have already run the notebook. We'll go through it. One thing that I would like to highlight is there might be cer certain libraries or certain code snippets that might be very new to you. Uh, I don't mind taking questions on that, but uh, the idea is to understand the techniques first. Uh, as a notebook would be shared as well, you could definitely search about that particular function or library and then you could easily understand what uh, I have done on that particular piece. At the same time, I'll try to explain it as much as I can. Uh, okay, last thing that, see, it's clustering is a big topic. I mean, on some of the techniques, I could talk about that particular technique for an hour or so. Okay, so I have tried to cover as much as possible, but I have also provided certain good links, uh, which are like articles on Medium or some blogs, okay, or some documentation, so that you could go through them uh, later. Okay, so I hope that helps you as well. Okay, so let me get back to the presentation. And so this is the agenda for the we start with understand your problem framework, right? So what's your problem? I mean, not your problem, but what's your uh, business problem? So data scientists generally follow a machine learning workflow, right? Most of you have seen it, if you are learning about data science, that you get some data, you actually pre-process it, clean it, manipulate it, uh, there are certain tasks involved in there, like uh, creating new variables, a missing value treatment, outlier treatment. Okay, feature engineering is very much important because you need to create informative features. So that is a step number two. Then comes the step number three, which is training your model. Right. So you train your model, and you uh, the, actually you create certain metrics on which you want to test it. I mean, is your model working or not? So that's the fourth step to test data and. Based on this particular steps, you keep improving your model. So that's a very typical. This is very important to understand. This is a standard process that everyone's following, or at least I have been following it for the last seven, eight years now. But that's step number three, train model. So which model, right? So machine learning algorithms could be divided into four different categories. Uh, so one is supervised learning, another is unsupervised. There's something called semi-supervised, and then comes the reinforcement learning, okay? So this is the way uh, a problem could be framed, and then you have different techniques within each of these buckets that you could use, okay? Uh, uh, so let me move and talk about each of these buckets, okay? So, wait. Okay, I hope this is not cool. So let's start with supervised learning. Uh, so this is the most common type of machine learning problems that we solve on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we actually get some sort of a data that is labeled. Labeled means you have the ground truth about it. So most of the supervised problems are something like you have been given uh, so some things, let's say called A, and then there's a, another thing which is called label, that is B. You have to find out a relation between A and B a function between A and B. So a function, which is something like Y is equal to FX, right? If you input X, then you should get Y. So that is what supervised learning is, okay? Or that is, most of the framework is in that type, but in supervised learning, you actually have both the values of Y and X that you have seen in history. So let's say you get this data of images, you have different images, but you have labeled images as well, that which of those images are cats. Then you train a model, okay? As in what are cats and what are not cats, Based on that understanding, you get a classifier. A classifier is nothing but, as I said, a functional form or an equation that uh, uh, if you provide an input to it, it will give an output to you, okay? So yes, so that gives you, uh, so if you run that particular classifier on the test data, then it will tell you, okay, whether that image is a cat or not cat. It's, it's always probability, right? I mean, when I say that it says whether it's a cat or not cat, it actually gives you a probability. If the probability is high, then you can definitely say, okay, I'm 100% confident that this is a cat. Otherwise you are 90% confident or otherwise you are 60% confident. So the probabilities are like important part of it. 
and supervised learning could be divided into classification and regression. So let's not spend much time here. Let's move to the next unsupervised. So this is what we are going to uh, talk about for the rest of the uh, session. But unsupervised learning, yes, you don't have any label. I mean, if you have been given so many images, you don't know what kind of an image that is. I mean, maybe a, a human could recognize, okay, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a cow. But a machine don't know whether that's a cow or a, or, or a, a dog or a cat. So what machine does is based on certain features. And when I say features, it's most of the times in numerical format. Even if you get audio data, video data, or image data, right? You finally convert those that particular information into some kind of a numeric coding so that a machine could identify the patterns into it and then do a particular job on top of it. Okay, I hope that is clear so far. So in unsupervised, yes, you actually feed in those features and then machine tries to find out those patterns. Okay, so if there is a cat, then the cat looks something like this, while a kangaroo looks something like this, while a dog looks something like this, right? So there are certain patterns that our eyes, human eyes could identify. A machine tries to identify the same and try to group it. And clustering, that is, that is what we are going to talk about today, is one of the most important uh, unsupervised uh, learning techniques. Uh, anomaly detection, yes, it's very important. Um, actually, anomaly detection is a problem area that is there for so long and people are actually researching on it. There are so many techniques, but there is so much to learn over there, okay? So in case you are looking for being an expert in unsupervised learning, you know, clustering and anomaly detection are really good areas where one could focus on, okay? Okay. Then comes semi-supervised. Okay, so this is interesting. So over here, the images are there. They are not labeled, but still you want to create a classifier on top of it, okay? And so a machine, if you, if you do unsupervised learning, a machine could identify different kinds of patterns. I mean, if you try to give these images to an unsupervised machine learning technique, it could find out a pattern that how is, are the ears upright or they are down, okay? So that is also a pattern, right? And uh, it could create some kind of a functional form for that a particular pattern as well. But if you have a goal that, no, I want to classify this data into, again, a cat versus no cat, right? Then you need to do some kind of a uh, labeling so that you could, again, go to the supervised learning format. So what you do is you take a sample and somehow you get it labeled. Now, if you have an expert labeler, then a person would sit down or a few persons would sit down and actually they would label it. And that's actually that happens. I have seen use cases in Walmart wherein we have to classify the strawberries into a good strawberry versus a bad strawberry. And even bad strawberries has different kind of categories which only human could identify. So actually we actually asked some expert to label it so that we could create a supervised learning on it. So that's a proper semi-supervised format. So yeah, so you could actually get an expert to label it. And <coughs> you know, then once you have the label data, you create a classifier on top of it. Okay, so that's semi-supervised. Reinforcement learning. Okay, now this is really interesting. Again, I mean, if people are not aware about reinforcement learning, I would say do read about it. This is a topic which is very much unexplored again but this has so much potential. I mean, if something could beat human intelligence, definitely one of the thing is reinforcement learning. Because in reinforcement learning, you are not giving any sort of a, uh, any sort of data which comes from human intelligence. So what, So let's say if you're playing a game and if, if a human is playing a game and if you're recording it that if a human went up or if he press up button or a down button, then what was the response on the game? If you keep recording it, at best, the machine could learn is uh, the, the way that human is playing. I mean, a machine could replicate what that human is doing, but it can never be better than that particular human for which we recorded the data. But in reinforcement learning, there is an agent which is set up in an environment, and it's, that agent keeps exploring and keep exploiting. So these are two phrases that you will again and again hear if you read about reinforcement learning. 
exploration and exploitation exploration of uh, uncharted territory while exploitation of current knowledge and you keep exploiting and exploring and you get a reward for whatever action you take okay based on that reward you actually change the probabilities okay of exploring and exploitation and you try to change the probabilities in a way that you are more likely to get more reward so it's always about the cumulative reward so if you heard about uh, a artificial intelligence beating ai go game uh, the go game and artificial intelligence beating uh, dota uh, best player one on one so that is reinforcement learning reinforcement learning was used to beat the best humans in those games okay so this is really interesting okay i'll move forward so find your problem framework yeah that's the key question so ai is it looking for patterns in massive amounts of data yes great it's machine learning is it being told what to look for no or yes okay so if it is being told what to look for then it's a telltale sign for supervised learning right we have the labels is it using deep learning neural networks then it becomes a deep learning supervised learning right what about here is it being told what to look for no then it is trying to reach an objective through trial and error so as i told you reinforcement learning is trial and error so yes then it becomes a reinforcement learning if it is not using trial and error then it is unsupervised learning and any of these techniques if you use deep learning along with them it becomes a deep learn okay so that's a very that this particular flow chart is given by mit tech review person and i found it interesting so i kept it here by the way thanks to all the folks who have put the content online uh, because that really helps you to keep increasing your knowledge and again giving back to the community i have given all the sources at the back of whatever content i have produced uh, that is like completely original that will also go back to open source and i hope that helps someone okay so there is much more to unsupervised learning than k means plus sign uh okay i have put unknown to it it's me actually so unsupervised machine learning so i have already explained unsupervised machine learning but see the kind of techniques or the gamut that we have within unsupervised learning so clustering is definitely one which we are going to talk about today but see dimensionality reduction when we talk about principal component analysis or sing uh, svd singular variable decomposition these are all dimensionality reduction we don't use any dependent variable here these are completely unsupervised uh anomaly detection so this is very important by the way many of the clustering techniques could be used for anomaly detection okay so uh, keep that in mind that if you are actually good at clustering uh, you can actually become good at anomaly detection as well but anyways there are uh, many other techniques if you know support vector machines they score something called one class svm as well which don't use dependent variable and is still an unsupervised uh, machine learning technique okay and there is so much research going on here i mean you keep looking for it and new papers keep coming in neural networks okay so svm self organizing maps that's that can be used both uh, for anomaly detection uh, so both for clustering and anomaly detection auto encoders is really interesting uh, read about it it's very simple architecture but it's so powerful that you could do many things with that gans general adversarial networks uh, in somewhere like 3 4 months back there a website which becomes really uh, uh, popular that the person you are looking at does not exist right so gans is what they use okay and then called deep belief nets that is another important part so for the rest of the uh, yes yes i am i'm going to share my python notebook at the end of it. yeah so now i'll jump to the techniques okay so we will talk about clustering first hard and soft the intuition behind clustering so i mean most of you might know that clustering is a task of dividing the population right into a number of groups such that the the data points in the same group are more similar to the other data points right so and maybe you have come across a business problem and if you haven't haven't then these are the business problems that are generally uh, framed for clustering i mean understand customers purchasing behavior okay so many times actually business people come to us and i don't know what kind of customers do i have can you tell me give me more information about that and it's very important right because at an individual level i mean if you have customer data at an individual level you cannot do that kind of a personalized marketing 
when we talk about personalized marketing we actually first cluster the customers and then clusters so strategy is based on those group of personas that we find out similarly uh, many people talk about uh, customers uh, um, sorry customers talk about the brand on social media uh, or they write reviews for your app so how can we find out what are they talking about you know what kind of topics are they talk talking about so can we identify that sometimes it's just about can i uh, cluster the positive versus the negative uh, top uh, reviews but this is third problem and this is what actually i am working on so in walmart on the e-commerce uh, you have different suppliers who fill in the uh, information for different items and there are so many incorrect data in there i mean so how to find out those incorrect data because you don't know what is incorrect you know uh, you come to know only when you say that okay i am going to fix this particular uh, let's say almira in a 2 by 2 feet by 2 by 2 by 1 feet box but it's not going to happen and you incur a lot of charges on that actually sometimes we have to incur 50 dollars shipping charge on a 5 dollar item just because the dimensions that we looked into were incorrect so this is one of the problem that i am working on quite interesting but why do we need clustering so here comes the main part so see uh, most of times as you can see data science role is filled with supervised learning tasks okay you have to do some kind of an objective modeling that this is what i have to find how can i predict y with help of x or what is the relation between y and x what are the drivers that are helping me drive sales or price or you know uh, customer loyalty things like that and hence we can use the cn tree and regression but no one talks about the natural grouping okay so hence clustering comes into play i mean given certain features clustering will help you find out natural groupings okay and those natural groupings could be used for multiple strategies so a say a decision tree is built on customer prof profitability in next three months this segmentation can be used uh, only for prof profitability strategy but not for loyalty strategy or retention strategy but if you have natural clusters without any objective or without any label then you could actually form natural clusters and then see how to target them or how to if if, if you are not talking about customers what a natural segments look like okay so clustering could be divided into two parts so i hope you have seen it here i have divided clustering into two parts hard and soft and uh, within hard i have divided into hierarchical partitioning and density first i'll talk about hard was a soft clustering and you know i i'll come to the coding part as well uh, but i think it's important to understand the whole flow so that you could create this kind of a map in your mind so that the next time you come up with a problem you know where should i go and look into okay so in hard clustering each data point belongs to a cluster completely okay is that person uh uh okay is it's more like okay is that a cat or is that a dog okay something like that in soft clustering it's not about giving one particular label to one particular data point we actually provide probabilities that this particular document talks about politics 60% of the times and 40% of the times it's also talking about uh, you know economy so that's the kind of grouping and this is very important you know so a good example is uh for item for i for item search on e-commerce platform like flipkart and amazon if someone is looking for uh, uh shoes it could be both sports shoes and a casual shoes i mean a particular kind of a shoe could be both sports shoes and a casual shoes hence you if you hard cluster them that shoe would appear only in one of the hierarchy right so it's important that you even if a person search any of the option then that particular uh, item would show up okay so now we start okay we are 25 minutes into the session um, now we are starting hierarchical clustering that's one of the hard clustering okay that's pretty old and as you know it's actually hierarchical decomposition of data points okay and there is one structure that we develop which is dendrogram okay so if something If someone is talking about hierarchical clustering this dendrogram would always appear but the way we make this dendrogram 
uh, I, I mean, there are many, many different ways to do it. And I'll talk about that. So first of all, at a high level, hierarchical decomposition uh, of the data could happen in two ways. Either you start with all points as individual clusters, OK? Uh, as in you start with 1, 3, 2, 5, 4, 6 here, OK? Or it could be divisive. I mean, all the points are together, and then you start dividing that one big cluster into smaller clusters, right? But at any point of time, I mean, plus, there could be many clusters. I mean, you have to define some sort of a stopping criteria. And I'll come to that. Anyway, so first thing, hierarchical clustering, it's more like decomposition of data based on hierarchy. <coughs> and it could be agglomerative and divisive. Divisive algorithms are not that common and not that attractive as well. I mean. Uh, but his uh, agglomerative are very common and it involves some sort of a this calculating a dissimilarity between two data points so when you're talking about data points just look at these black dots here please one two three four five six these are data points let's say in a 2d space they are spread out like this so what i know is one and three are very close to each other right it looks like two and five are again close to each other so i join one and three here okay and the uh, this vertical line here that shows the distance between the two okay now two and five okay i join two and five as well because they are also close to each other four and six are actually a bit far, far. now i have to join this cluster to another cluster so what i see is two and five together is more close to four as compared to any other point so i join two and five cluster that this cluster with four and i get a bigger cluster okay so that's what i have done here and then this cluster is more close to the cluster one and three as compared to six. Now, one could debate on this. How is this cluster closer to this cluster than point number six, right? So that's what I'm talking about, that this similarity, the measuring of this similarity could be done in multiple ways, okay? And let's talk about that first, because in most of the clustering techniques, we create some kind of a correlation okay or dissimilarity or a distance okay so let's talk about this now in hierarchical clustering dissimilarity is a function of distance metric and a linkage criterion so distance metric let's talk about distance metric if you are into data science you might have heard euclidean distance this is the most common distance it's the length of the part directly connecting two points pythagoras theorem everyone has learned it so I mean, it's not exactly Pythagoras theorem, but yes, in multiple dimension, it's Pythagoras theorem. Let's assume, okay. Manhattan distance, okay, Manhattan distance is the distance that our taxi or cabs follow, right? We follow a road. Uh, if you come to HSR Bangalore, it's completely uh, into blocks. So all the distances there are Manhattan distances, okay? So it's actually also called taxi cab geometry or city block distance. So if you have to go from, from this point to this point, you take this particular path, right, or this particular. So, so it's the absolute, as a sum of the absolute differences between the coordinates of different data points. Mahalanobis distance, okay. So Mahalanobis is the person, uh, if you remember ISI, so he's the one who was founder of ISI. And Mahalanobis uh, distance was invented by him. So what happens is when you calculate Euclidean distance, you are assuming that all the dimensions are perpendicular to each other till the time you are uh, talking about three dimensions you could visualize it human could visualize only three dimensions but if you go higher than three dimensions you cannot visualize it so that's an assumption that all are uh, all the dimensions are perpendicular to each other and they don't have any correlation between them but many times we have seen that the different uh, dimensions or features have correlation and hence uh, to solve that problem, a Mahalanobis distance comes into picture, which also takes care of the covariance metrics. Okay, so in some of the use cases, this might be important, but most of the times, Euclidean distance is very common. Manhattan distance is another common example. So let's say if you are trying to uh, cluster geographical regions, let's say on a, a, a map of Bangalore, you would use Manhattan distance. Or let's say if you're trying to uh, cluster pizza shops in Bangalore, then you would use Manhattan distance rather than Euclidean distance because unless you are flying on a drone, you want to use Euclidean distance. 
because you are going on road and you will have to calculate Manhattan distance somehow. Also read about cosine, haversine, hamming. Haversine, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, haversine distance is the distance on the big, uh, I mean, uh, on our earth or globe. So if you have latitude and longitude, if you want to cluster, let's say, how oh, let's say what, cities, okay? Cities of the world, then you are going to use haversine distance. Uh, Similarity. Now we talk about the linkage criteria. Okay, so when on my first slide of the circuit clustering, when I was saying that how do we decide which two clusters or which two data points are near to each other? So you have to apply some kind of a linkage criteria. Okay, so a single link linkage or the nearest neighbor. Okay, so let's say C1 is one cluster here and C2 is one cluster here. So the nearest two points between the two clusters, that's a single linkage. Okay. So between PI and PJ, let's say my distance metric is Euclidean, then I'll calculate the Euclidean distance between the two. If the if this distance is lesser than the distance of PI with any other cluster, okay, then I'm going to combine C1 and C2 together. So that's single linkage, okay? Complete linkage is the farthest point. So if you have to combine two clusters, you look at the given distance metric, be it Euclidean, but you look at the distance between the farthest two points. And there are many other options. I have given a link to SciPy documentation. There are many other options. Uh, there is one thing called WARD, W-A-R-D, WARD distance. That's what people use mostly for high clustering. Uh, uh, that's uh, actually an average of variance or more like squared sum of errors. Uh, so, that is what people use, but these linkages are important to understand. And they have certain properties as well, right? So single linkage, it generates minimum spanning tree. This can cause premature merging of groups. I mean, because even if two points are close to each other, it will try to merge them too. And hence, it could actually merge two groups very soon, which we might not like. At the same time, if we talk about farthest point, it encourages compact clusters. So if you want small clusters, go for a complete linkage. If you want group average, you want all the points to be very closely uh, linked together. I mean, you want a very dense cluster, then go, go for group average. So every linkage criteria has a property. And hence I'm saying, and I let me highlight this point again. Clustering is a bit of a subjective, or I would say, a, quite a subjective process. You need to know a little bit about what that problem is, what are the expectations, expected outcomes of it to actually get good results, okay? And all these things will actually help you to take those good decisions as well. So I think we are good on this similarity. How do we decide, okay? So you create this dendrogram based on the dissimilarity, okay? A dendrogram is a tree-like diagram that records sequences of merges or splits. No big deal. Um, it just combines all the points. Okay, we are talking about agglomerative, so we go from bottom to top, and it combines different clusters. We actually, if you want a good clustering, what you do is you look for this a longest vertical distance which you could cut, and so if you the longest vertical distance here is between point A to B, hence you draw two horizontal lines A and B. And the wherever this line cuts or the vertical lines, so count those groups and that would be the number of clusters. So one, a two over here, a three over here, and four over here. So in this particular dendrogram, uh, the optimal number of clusters would be four. If you cut anywhere else, you would still get uh, clusters. If you cut somewhere here, then you would get two clusters, a big cluster over here, a big cluster over here. but you know, you could do better at clustering and hence the dendrogram is suggesting that you should make a cut below 0 0.55 and not above it. That's the whole idea. Okay. So let's go to notebook. Uh, okay. Ping me if you cannot see my notebook. I, otherwise, we are fine. So hierarchical clustering. Let's look at simulated data. Okay. I'm importing pandas and numpy. Okay. Uh, and matplotlib to plot some of the charts. I created this data, okay? So if you plot it, this looks something like this. Uh, this is a two dimension. So what we do is, 
uh, we actually created a dendrogram, right? So for dendrogram, you use SciPy uh, cluster hierarchy. See, SciPy is actually backend of uh, scikit-learn. So don't mind if I'm using SciPy here because it's one and the same thing. Uh, and if you see over here, so I'm giving this data x, okay? So okay, let's be on it. So x1, I have defined an error. x2, I have defined an error. Okay. Uh, if you plot x1 and x2, this is what we have. I combine x1 and x2 in another array, okay, with the uh, all the rows of x1 uh, in rows. Uh, so I, I reshape it, and then we have two columns, okay. So if you want to see x, okay, this is how it looks. Okay. Now, if you have to uh, create a dendrogram. This is the kind of dendrogram you create. Now let's see here that uh, the method I'm using is what. Okay, I told you what is actually minimizing the overall variance. You could use single as well. But I think we can run it. It won't take time. Okay, okay, this is fine. Uh, so this is what. Let's try single here. Okay, so see, in single you are getting. Uh, longer, uh, bigger clusters. I mean, you will definitely cut here. You will get three clusters here. That's not fine. Even Ward is suggesting that, but the idea is that you are getting more, num uh, you know, bigger clusters over here. You could also use complete or average, and then dendrogram would change, and hence your output. So keep that in mind that you need to know. Okay. Is there any better method? Okay, we will talk about that. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, I'll get to one of the question where uh, we are going to talk about what are the other ways to find number of clusters. Uh, so I'll definitely talk about that. Uh, Jupyter link, I'll uh, Jupyter notebook I'll share at last. Python notebook would be shared. Yes. Soft clustering is more like regression kind of continuous, and hard clustering is like classification. Okay. See, even hard, no, no, th uh, this is not true, and I'll tell you why. Even in classification, you get probabilities, right? That it's 70% class A and 30% class B. It's just that we create a threshold that anything about 60% is class A, and hence we say this is cat. But still, there are probabilities. So, good analogy, but still, it's not very accurate. So, anyways, coming back to this. So, yes, uh, as per this uh, met linkage method, you will have different kind of dendrograms. I'll go back to what. That's how my code it is. So as you could see, the biggest vertical line is the red one. And hence, we uh, create a cut at y equal to 10, which gives us what I do here is, actually, I use the SKLN cluster. And there's a function called agglomerative clustering. So now, as I know the number of Clusters which I have to provide. I provide the number of clusters, affinity, which is a distance matrix that we talked about. I gave Euclidean and the linkage we talked about. I gave what, right? So these all these things could be changed. Here you could use Manhattan or Milanovis, or in here you could use single or complete. And then you print. Uh, you, you run this the cluster dot fit. Okay, on this data. Now it gives you cluster label. Uh, the print will give you cluster labels. Okay, so cluster dot labels. And what you do is you plot the complete data, okay? Uh, the first column as x, the second column as y, cluster labels, and as color, and the marker is, okay. And this is what you got. Oops, now something happened. Okay, so look at these three clusters that we formed. Okay, fine and good. Now, guys, uh, we are running behind time. Okay, what I have done is, uh, see, you will get a notebook, but I should tell you what you could do here. I have created another data set, and I have tried to create some outliers here, and have, I have tried to join, uh, give some points here as well. So try it. This is this is what I'm talking about. If you, okay, I have commented it. Uh, if you try to run it and run the complete thing, you would get a different kind of result. That would be really interesting. Okay, in hierarchical clustering, so this is a simulated data I'm talking about. Uh, there is a wholesale business customer segmentation that I have done for you. I'll talk about this. Okay, let's do it. So 
This data is actually UCI machine learning repository uh, on which you could get this data. The idea is to cluster uh, the customers uh, uh, together. I mean, what kind of customers do we have? So we done this, we look at uh, the data. So we have 440 rows here and eight variables. You could see the variables over here. Okay. Uh, now, one important thing, when we are talking about distance, we always try to normalize the variables. And I'll tell you why, because if you are trying to capture, let's say customers, okay, then customers would have different variables. So one is age, which won't be more than 100 most of the times, right? Uh, and there, another would be income, let's say monthly income, which would go in thousands, right? Now, if you try to create a distance variable and if you use Pythagoras theorem, then your income would completely bias the final outcome. Hence, it's important that you normalize the data before you create uh, uh, any kind of a, uh, if, you, if you have to use any kind of distance metric on top of it. This is what I've done. I have used SQL and pre-processing normalized function over here. This gives you, gives you normalized data. Then I create a dendrogram on it because we have being so busy at the bottom. Okay, I find the biggest line over here. So I cut it over here and hence I'm going to get two cluster. Okay, so that's what I run it over here. I again give number of clusters equal to two, affinity Euclidean and linkage board. Okay. And that gives you some labels. And this is what I'm trying to plot here. So, okay, so those those labels, so all your data points will have some kind of label. So this is what I'm plotting it over here. So as you could see, the yellow dots are separated by this, uh, whatever color it is, purple, okay? Uh, but there's certain mix as well. Note, this data is, this data has multiple columns. I have plotted only two columns here, right? So if I change the column, uh, what all columns do we have? Let's say grocery. Then the this would change. Oops, sorry, I have to have to run this whole thing. But anyway, I hope you get the point. So you could change, but this is not the best way to visualize your multi-dimensional data, and that's the reason I have given you a very good example here. And I'll take you through this because we are going to use this example again and again. A wine clustering problem. So you have two different kinds of wines, white wine and red wine. You read the data and you also have the type. Okay, so this is actually, you have the labels here. I'm not at all trying to run super, clustering on a supervised learning problem, but this is more to get the intuition that whether we are able to separate white and red wine somehow, or is the natural clusters, can the natural clusters classify the red and white wine. And hence we have the labels here, but don't think that this is a supervised learning problem. And I have put that in notes as well, so no big deal. Okay, so we have this data. The type variable tells you if it is one, it means it's a white wine, otherwise red wine. Again, so we have more white wines, 4,800 uh, as compared to red wines. And then again, I have to do the scaling. I have removed the type column, which is a true label, and then the, then the scaling. Then I have created a dendrogram. And as you could see, somehow with the variables like acidity, citric acid, residual sugar, chlorides, density, pH, somehow the data is able to learn that there are two distinct clusters in this group. We haven't provided any information whether it's a red wine or a white wine, right? So somehow it's learning. And hence we have taken cluster numbers as two and that's what we run over here and okay so that's what we run over here we get the labels and the wine data frame we provide the predictions as labels here i am trying to create a cross tab please don't get confused that this is not a confusion matrix because we are not uh, doing any classification here we are just seeing that if natural wine or not. And as you could see, the type zero, okay, which is a red wine falls under one of the bucket, which is zero as per our prediction. And while the white, uh, red wine or white wine is going into the dark cluster. Now, as I told you, for visualization, for visualizing multi-dimension on a 2D graph, it's very difficult. So what you do is you do dimensionality reduction. What I've done here is I have run PCA on the wine 
data. So all the variables that I had at the top, I actually run PC on these variables to bring to bring down the variables from multi-dimension to two dimensional so that I could plot it. Okay, so I created two components. As if you are not aware, PCA tries to capture as much variance as possible uh, in lesser number of dimensions. Okay, and then you actually plot it. So as you could see, I am plotting the two principal components and the labels. Okay, so zero for red, one for white, and as you could see, R clustering is able to classify red versus the white wine. Okay. Again, this is not a supervised learning problem. This is more to get intuition that how data could actually give us natural clusters. This data is also very standard data collected for some north of Portugal. Okay, so it, it, please explore it. Okay, explore this notebook. Guys, to be frank, I cannot take you through each and everything. There's so much to talk about. It's just a one and a half a webinar. I'll try to give you as many good information as much good information as possible so that you get a head start on each of the technique okay and if you really want to get into it in case you run into any questions i'll be more than happy to solve it even later because that helps me learn more okay so there is no problem in case you approach me later <coughs> uh, okay so we will uh, close relative pressing with advantages and disadvantages so advantages, yes, we do not have to assume any particular number of clusters, right? We actually look at the dendrogram and make the cut, and that's give us the number of clusters that we should form. Okay, uh, this is very much important because many times you have to create taxonomies. I said, what comes under what? So if you have to create a linkage kind of clustering that, just to give an example, in Walmart, in one of the business forum, we wanted to find out we, a cluster which talks about customer service, Okay, out of all the reviews data. So one cluster would talk about customer service, one of cluster would talk about item. But within customer service, we wanted to talk about the time taken uh, to respond back. So those are the sub-clusters within a cluster. So if you want to create such kind of a uh, linkage clustering, then hierarchical clustering is very useful. Now, the biggest disadvantage and why we don't use hierarchical clustering whenever the data size becomes big, it's the time complexity is order of n cube. Okay, uh, n cube means if you have 10 data points, then the complexity becomes 10 into 10 into 10. Okay, so as you keep increasing the number of data points, it from if it becomes from 10 to 100, the complexity uh, becomes 10 to the power six. Okay, so as you keep increasing data, hierarchical clustering takes so much time. In the code, I have uh, tried to capture it. Okay, and we are going to compare it later. I have tried to capture this percent percent time. If you write percent percent time in your code snippet, it will run this code for two, three loops or 10 loops and it will give you a wall time. So it takes 1.54 seconds just to run on a small data set. And we will run the same data set with k-means clustering and see why k-means clustering is faster than hierarchical percent. Okay. So when you work on big data problem, that really becomes a challenge. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have 40 minutes left. Cool. Okay, we talk about partitioning clustering now. So we talked about hierarchical. We talk about partitioning clustering now. So partitioning cluster actually, it again also decomposes the data points into k clusters. Now when I say k clusters, yes, we have to provide k as an input. And the way it, uh, clusters is, uh, it, it is derived by closeness of the data points to a particular point of gravity. So it's not always a centroid, first of all. So that's the reason I'm calling it center of gravity. It could be centroid, it could be midoid, it could be anything else. You define it, right? But it is trying to optimize a certain those points towards a particular center of gravity. It's an iterative process. You, it, I mean, the, the algorithm runs multiple times to come up to the final thing. Uh, it's always good to have prior knowledge because as you have to provide a number of clusters, uh, it, if you have prior knowledge that gives you, a, it actually helps you in finding the number of clusters. Again, I'm going to talk about a technique for finding the uh, number of clusters, but I have worked on multiple problems. Sometimes those techniques don't work very properly and hence you have to rely on a business knowledge as well. And I'll come to that. K-means, K-midoids, Clarence, these are some standard techniques which are partition based. There are so many others, but these are the common techniques that we use. 
everyone has talked about k-means clustering. I won't take much time. You take the choose the number of clusters k. Uh, you know, randomly. So you will have to initialize the centroids. You could actually divide the data randomly into k parts and calculate the centroid, or you just randomly assign uh, k random points as cluster centers. Then you assign each point to the nearest cluster center. Okay. So now you have those uh, k centers. You assign each point to that center if it is like nearest to that center only, not others. And then you recompute the cluster centers and you keep repeating this process and hence it is called an iterative process. I know maybe it's not uh, very, uh, you're not able to understand it quickly, but I'll make sure that you understand it in a while. This is a K-means example of a standard textbook format. This is the data you assign three clusters. These three clusters divide the data into three parts based on the distances. Okay, now you have got points assigned to this cluster. You again calculate the centroid. Centroid is nothing but the averages of all the coordinates or all the, all the features for all the points. Hence, C1 moves from here to here because this, this centroid would be more closer to these points. And then the C1 comes here. You again repeat the process. Then C1 comes here, C3 here, C2 here. Quite boring. Let's look an interesting one. Okay, I think I have some questions. I'll quickly look at it. Mm. Okay, on what basis we decide it should be Manhattan or uh, Euclid, uh, Euclidean? I already covered it. Please read about it. Uh, depends on use case. Okay, cool. In implementing as as we have entrances to state. Okay, I I'll talk about it. Okay, this is a fantastic visualization. Please uh, look at this link once you get this. Okay, so I'm choose uniform points. Okay, these are the uniform points. We are going to do k-means clustering on it. So let's say I see three clusters over here. So I assign one cluster centroid here. So all the points are associated to it. I assign second point here. So now because the points on this vertical line are more similar to blue, so the right side becomes blue, the left side becomes red. I am add another centroid. Okay. Update centroids. Centroids gets updated. Again, the point gets reassigned. Again, the centroids get updated. And the process keeps repeating. This is not very clear, right? I'll I'll take another point, another example. Something like this, maybe. Okay. So we say go, update centroids. Okay, the new cluster centroids comes in again, reassign points. The points keep reassigning again and again, and that's how it works. Let's do some other Gaussian mixture. I take one point here, one point here, one point. So I say five clusters. Guys, do you notice one thing? That's one of the drawback of K-means clustering. This shape is called Vernoni diagram. So. The kind of clustering k-means is doing is spherical in nature. I mean, if a cluster has some other shape, k-means would still try to cut that cluster in this kind of a vernoid diagram. Okay, so it's a disadvantage, uh, and I'll show you with some example as well. So again, I update the centroids, but as you see, it has already converged. The algorithm has converged; it's not moving anymore. So what it also tells us is the initialization of the centroid is very much important. If you initialize the centroids incorrectly, then the clusters form would be incorrect as well. I'll go back to my PPT. So I talked about the k-means uh, logic, right? One could actually write this code in Python from scratch. You don't need to use any library, but you need to stop somewhere, right? If it is an iterative process, where are you going to stop? So just read these three points quickly. If there are no reassignments of data points to different clusters, I mean the points are stable, they are not getting reassigned. Or there are no change of centroids. I mean, even uh, if you take, uh, keep iterating the process, the centroids are the same. Or it could be possible that minimum decrease in the sum of square error, SSC. It's like you have already reached the threshold, it's not decreasing anymore, and let's stop here. So SSC is nothing, it's just the the sum of the squared distance between the centroid and the points which are associated to that centroid. Okay, nothing more. Don't get afraid of it. It's just the centroid minus, you know, uh, the distance between the centroid and the points associated with that centroid. 
Uh, if you square it and then take a sum, that gives you squared sum of errors. And this tells you about the quality of your clustering. So it was when someone was asking me about uh, the clustering, when can we use some other way? You could actually use this SSE concept in hierarchical clustering as well. It would be a bit tricky, but you could still do it. Or what you could do is with the help of dendrograms, uh, try to find out your number, whether it should be four clusters or six clusters. For those clusters, calculate SSE and compare the two. Whichever gives you higher uh, a lesser uh, error, you take that cluster. In k-means, what you do is, you actually create this elbow chart. So you plot squared sum of errors on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you plot actually a different number of clusters. So let's say three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, and you calculate SSE for all those clusters, okay? So first of all, you give only two centroids, and then see what SSE is. Then you give three centroids, then you give four centroids. Now, what you look for here is that if I go from one centroid to two centroid, see there is a steep drop in error. Okay, it means we are getting better clusters, finer clusters, which makes much more sense. Even if you go from two to three, oops, then you go, you get a significant drop in SSE. I mean, a significant drop in error. But when you're going from three to four or five or six, that drop is not that significant. What it means is the marginal drop in uh, SSC after cluster number three is not that great. And see, if you keep increasing the number of clusters at one point, every point will become a cluster of its own. So this actually curve is going to cut uh, the chart somewhere on X axis, okay? And SSC will become zero, but that's what, that's, that is not what we want, right? We want some meaningful clusters and this is the point uh, that I'm going to take, that, that just the, uh, the data should have three clusters. So elbow chart is a very good technique. There is something called sellout coefficient. I'm not going to discuss about it. There's a link in there, read about it. It's a very, uh, it's an N square uh, complexity, time complexity, and it takes time. So in uh, big, huge data, it's not very efficient, but uh, SSE could be calculated easily. Next slide. Okay. So we talk about k dots now. Now in k means, what happens is k means, right? So it takes the mean, it takes the mean of all the different features. So what you get is a mean. So see, see over here. These are the data points. One data point is here. Because one data point is here, which is more like an outlier, but k means is a hard clustering. It will try to cluster all the points. Hence, it gives you a centroid over here. Do you think it makes sense? I mean, this centroid is so much outside of these points, which are very closely associated, and the centroid is lying somewhere outside it. I mean, so what it means is k means is very respectable to outliers. Uh, it's that it's it's not very tolerant to outliers. And see this midoid. Now, when I say midoid, it's the point which is the point from one of the data points. So if you have given 10 points, midoid would be one point among them. Okay. So it's a midoid would always be one point among your data points. Hence your midoid is here. Still the cluster is this big uh, and it's taking the outlier as well, but still, you know, uh, it is more tolerant to outliers. Hence, uh, if you see that there's too much noise in your data, then it's always better to have, uh, better to use k-midoids. Okay, PAM is one algorithm. It's called partitioning around midoids. Uh, you can read about it. Okay, so again, advantages and disadvantages of uh, partitioning clustering. It's very simple, right? Partitioning clustering. I just showed you that visualization. I mean, uh, even a, a a person who is who has no background background about uh, machine learning could understand K means or a partition based clustering from there. The time complexity. It's O T K N. What it means is uh, T is the number of iterations, K is the number of clusters, N is the number of data points. So it actually, it's pretty much linear because T and K won't be too high and hence it's pretty much linear. So hierarchical clustering is like an order of N cube or N square log N. This is an order of N or N log N max. So K means is quite faster than hierarchical clustering. On small data, Many times hierarchical clustering gives better results, but most of the times these days we work on big data and hence, you know, partition, uh, 
if I have uh, given a choice, choice between the hierarchical and k means, I'll, I'm going to use a partition based cluster. Cool. Disadvantages lands on the user to specify the number of clusters. High sensitivity to initialization phase. Okay. So let's do one thing. And inability to deal with non complex clusters. Again, I'll go back to that visualization and I'll tell you what. Oops. Oh, wait, I had to restart it. So I give one point here, okay, one point here and one point here. So I'm initializing three centroids here, okay? And let's say one point here. So I want to create four clusters, do I see three clusters only, but I want to do it. So see, because we have initializers here, we are not able to get four clusters. Ideally, we should get four clusters if we demand for one, right? So if I again give initialize like this, or something like this, then see, let's, let, let's see what's happening. See, I'm getting four clusters, one yellow, red, blue, and green. So depending on how you initialize, uh, it makes a problem. Uh, again, I talk about smiley face. This is interesting. Okay, so I give one cluster here, one cluster here, one centroid here, so I'm not trying, a cluster is a wrong word, uh, one centroid here. And let's see what happens. So over a period of time, it forms three clusters, right? One red, one blue, one green. But if you see, this smiley face has actually four clusters that we could see, right? One, two eyes, one the smile, and then the circle, right? So it should ideally give four clusters, but k-means is not able to do it. So these are some of the drawbacks of k-means. And uh, the last thing I told you, the non-convex clusters, right? So in the smiley face, as you see, they were non-convex clusters and still k-means was not able to identify it. Because k, so k-means is very much suitable for the spherical clusters, okay? So if you have an idea that the clusters are going to be spherical, then uh, use k-means, otherwise not. Okay, I'll come to density-based clustering now. So in the hard clustering, this is the third kind of clustering we are going to talk about. By the way, I love this technique. Uh, So the idea behind density based clustering, which is self-explanatory, that it is talking about some sort of a density of points. Okay. So, and this technique also talks about noise. So this is the first time we are talking about noise. Okay. When I say noise or outliers, these are the points which are like really far away from a group of points. Okay. So they should not be combined in the cluster, but still k-means and hierarchical actually combine those points as well, so which is not good. So we want to identify outliers as well so that uh, we get better clusters or more defined clusters. Okay, so that's the third point. Density-based methods have noise tolerance and can discover non-convex clusters. DB scan, HDB scan, these are some of the techniques. So as you see this particular chart, the blue, so the, these are the data points, right? And as you can see, the clusters are weird in shape they are not spherical at all right so we talked right k means is used for spherical clusters but not for these kind of clusters and see how beautifully uh, this density based clustering gives you an output see one brown then blue you know with proper clusters and the points outside which don't have any uh, proper uh, color coding those are actually the noise on outliers i mean as per this clustering technique these points don't belong to any of the cluster cool so DB scan, okay, uh, this is a hyperlink. If you click on it, it will take you to the DB scan uh, research paper. Uh, if you really want to be an expert in some topic, uh, it's always good or advisable to read the, uh, the paper as well. But uh, as I told you, uh, learning by doing, first run the algorithm, try it on some data set, get a good intuition, intuition as in what it is doing, and then go and read about it. That way you would be able to understand much more out of it if you directly go and try to read it and then maybe someday you would apply it, okay? So anyway, it's a very small paper, go read. It's a very uh, interesting paper, I would say. And this DB scan is a recent algorithm, 96. It got an award in 2014. So see the output, uh, database one, database two, kind of shapes DB scan is able to identify, okay? See this? Uh, similarly, this is the comparison of K-means versus DB scan. 
So see, the k-means actually divided this green region. So it divided the data somewhere here. Anything above would be green, anything below would be blue. Similarly, this, this is a very standard two half moon problem. Okay, so see the k-means is giving the, the uh, points from both the moons as green, while DB scan is able to identify those two half moons and two circles here. So no doubt DB scan is a beautiful algorithm. Uh, so how does it work? What's time? Seven or six? Okay. Okay. So what it does is it has two hyperparameters. Okay. So you don't need to provide any number of clusters to DB scan. Okay. So the that k or uh, the disadvantage that you will have to have provide the number of clusters is gone here. What you provide here is the radius and the minimum points. So see, if a rate, if there is a certain radius, uh, let's say on a visualize it on a 2D plane, there are certain points. If you are giving a radius of let's say one, one unit. And if you're saying there should be at least four points within one unit radius, then actually you are giving some sort of an input in terms of density. Okay. Number of points per parameters, actually somehow you're giving an input in terms of density. So what it does is it randomly chooses points uh, from the data. Okay. And uh, build a ring around it of the given radius, which is one of the hyperparameter epsilon. And it tries to find the minimum number of points as the, another hyperparameter. So let's say we ask for four points within one unit, then it will ask, look for four points. If there are four points, then it will call that point from where it started or randomly cho uh, chose as the core point, okay? So that is the point from which you start growing cluster. So if you get a core point, which actually has four points within that one unit radius, then that is a starting of your cluster growth. Then from any random point within that uh, within that radius, you will again try to grow a ring, okay? And again, see if it meets the criteria of a core point. If it meets the criteria, the ring keeps growing. Uh, sorry for that. I, I'll share the content later. So, anyway, so uh, and if a particular point is far away it's not coming into any of the ring okay and it's not able to grow a ring of its own because it's not condition then it becomes a noise point which is an outlier so that's the blue point here what is a yellow point here so yellow point is a point which cannot be a core point so core point is a point which actually satisfies the condition of the minimum points available within that given radius so see this yellow point, it, it doesn't have four points within this yellow ring and hence it becomes a border point given this point is somehow a point in the core ring of some other core point. So for this particular red point, this yellow point satisfies this condition because one, two, three, four, four points are within this ring, which is of one unit. So this is the satisfying condition and hence this is how the clusters are grown. Again, let's visualize it <coughs> to get a better intuition. Okay, so what we are going to take is say uniform points. Okay, so epsilon, which is the radius, one unit, minimum points equal to four. Let me reduce the epsilon. So this is the radius. What we are saying is there should be four points within the 0.5 uh, radius. Is this condition getting satisfied? No. The clusters, <coughs> the algorithm is trying to randomly choose some points and grow the clusters. So one cluster is grown here, one cluster is grown here because the conditions are very strict and hence the cluster formation is not uh, entertained. So let's let's try to relax the conditions. So I am increasing the radius now. See what happens now. So the rings are bigger and because the rings are bigger, it is able to find four points within the rings and see the cluster growth is now uh, taking place. Okay, so till the time for all the points are checked, the clusters will keep going. So see, these are the different clusters. Red is one, yellow is one, this is one, okay? And all the other points, they are not able to satisfy any uh, the condition of the core point. Hence, all the other points are outliers. So as I told you at the start, clustering tech outlier detection as well, okay? So this is really interesting. Let's restart. I'll show it on some other data. So this is the smiley face we talked about, right? So let's again take a smaller rings, start. No, it's not working. 
So maybe you could decrease the radius or maybe you could decrease, uh, maybe you could increase the radius or decrease the points. Let me decrease the points and see it will, it will become faster. Or let's make it more faster. Okay, let's increase the radius. Now, the point that you should look here is that if we would have used k-means, we have seen k-means actually divides the data into Vernoi dog diagram or spherical clusters. Hence, the k-means would have divided the data into three or four parts. But density-based clustering is able to find out clusters which are non-convex, non-spherical in nature. Okay. So see how beautifully density uh, DB scan is able to find out one big cluster, which is the outside ring. Now this cluster is formed, so it starts randomly from oh, one of the smile. Right. And then the two eyes. Okay, I hope you got the point. Uh, let's move on. Uh, okay, so I have the DB scan code. Uh, where is it? Okay, wait. Okay. Hey, by the way, I haven't, uh, I do have the K means code as well. Mm. Okay, so here I have this data points which we have seen in hierarchical clustering. Okay, then we are trying to draw the elbow curve here. So this is the elbow that we are getting. So which clearly says that, you know, after three clusters, the drop in SSC. See, and this SSC function is also called distortion. So just don't get confused. Distortion and SSC are one and the same thing. And the way I have calculated SSC, uh, the distortion over here, I have given the complete explanation here, just uncomment it and run one by one and you would be able to understand how you calculate it, okay? Uh, I would have shown it, but see, for the sake of time, I cannot do it uh, here. So I know that the number of clusters should be three. So I provide that as an input, okay? Number of clusters equal to K, which is equal to three. It runs on the data and we then we try to visualize it and see how the clusters look like, okay? Uh, in another example, I just uh, simulated data and gave a one point here. So the cluster become this big and the centroid came outside. This. So that was one of the drawbacks that we talked about. Okay, cool. Uh, I also have this code on the wine clustering problem that I showed you in the hierarchical clustering. Uh, again, in the wine clustering, this is the elbow curve that we are getting. Okay, so as I could see, one could debate whether there should be uh, no, clusters, two clusters or four clusters, okay? So we can actually try it for both. And that's what I have done at below. Just uncomment it and this, will, this code will run for four as well. And this is how the partition looks like for two clusters. Mm. One thing, I told you about time, right? Uh, we ran the same hierarchical clustering code above. This is the k-means code on the same data, okay, wine df scale data. It is just taking 78 milliseconds. In the last it was taking 1.6 seconds. So a big, big difference. And if you talk about bigger data sets, this difference would run into minutes and hours sometimes, okay? Because uh, when you talk about n squared and n cube complexity, time complexity, it becomes really big. Cool. I have DB scan for you here. By the way, please read, in, in case you want to use DB scan, please uh, read at least the first four sections of the research paper. Very intuitive, very simple. I have taken these points over here and trying to cluster them. This is one of the sections from DB scan paper, okay, uh, which talks about how to find the hyperparameters, right? So we talked about epsilon and minimum points, but you have to provide it as an input. So there is a way to do it, okay? What you do is actually, it's a bit tricky and it takes time to understand, but it uses the concept of nearest neighbor because at last what you're trying to say is that how many points have, let's say four points in a radius of one unit across them. So you have 100 points in the data set. How many out of 100 points have at least four points in a one unit radius around them. So that is what you are plotting here, okay? So if I look at this particular point and in this particular data, there are uh, four points, okay? For which if you take a radius of more than 2.23, that 
then you won't be able to find four points with it. Uh, you won't be able to find four points within it. And this is a hyperparameter. I have used it as four. If you want to look it for three, then change it to three. And a definition would be that if you take a radius of more than 2.23, then out of the total points, there would be at least four points who won't be able to grow their ring around them. Okay, so we talked about that minimum density, right? So DBSCAN talks about finding that thinnest cluster or the thinnest density with maximum number with the uh, largest radius. Okay. So this is the point because this at this point, uh, this is the largest radius with the thinnest cluster. Read about it here, and you will get an understanding about it. And based on that, actually, you could play with DB scan here. This is the output of DB scan on the same data set that I showed you. Okay, uh, we have provided as minimum samples as two. Hence, it is saying that this is also a cluster. If I would have said minimum uh points as three then it would have called it an outlier let's let me run it for you mm. okay let's look at this now okay we will play with this minimum samples two these are three clusters zero one and two let me say minimum samples as three let's see what happens okay do you see this minus one so the labels that we get out of db scan after running the db scan if you fit it on the data if the label is minus one it's an outlier so now it's saying this is an outlier let's increase it again minimum sample should be five okay nothing no no change okay let's decrease the radius then okay so at some point what will happen is this cluster will break one cluster would be this one another cluster would be this maybe over the extreme condition Okay, so yeah, you could play with these numbers and figure it out. Uh, I mean, I would suggest to use this particular uh, snippet, uh, my code snippet, because it's a very small data set and you could play it, play really well with this. You could actually add more points just by changing the numbers here. I have given you another uh, data set as well, just uh, uncommented and read it. And you could actually play with DB scan and actually intuitively understand as in how it works. Okay, so just uh, definitely do it okay uh, okay guys so uh, I'll, I'll we have 10 minutes left so we have covered hard clustering which is pretty much commonly used okay uh, but in soft clustering there are three techniques or I, at least the top two techniques GMM and uh, LDA which are used as well LDA is very LDA is very common but GMM as well so let's talk about uh, Gaussian mixture models. And these models are also called distribution models because you are trying to fit a distribution over here. Unlike hierarchical partition or density, you are not trying to fit any distribution. In Gaussian mixture model, from different groups, and all of those different groups could be uh, modeled using some sort of a distribution in Gaussian models that distribution is Gaussian distribution which is also called normal distribution this is a good example to understand it suppose the price of a randomly chosen paper book is distributed around ten dollars okay see this graph here so the blue line shows ten dollar is the mean while one dollar is the standard deviation while there's another book which is which has a hard cover uh, the average price is the mean price is 70 and the standard deviation is 1.5 so if you choose a book randomly Okay, so what would be the price of that randomly chosen book? And would that be normally distributed? So see, this blue is normal, this red is normal, but the combined probability of these two uh, groups, right, is cannot be modeled through a normal distribution. See this curve, okay? It has two modes. Two modes means two, two uh, largest values, one over here, another over here, and there is a drop in between. A normal distribution cannot be fitted on the complete data set. Hence, what you try to do is you try to identify or model these two individual Gaussian distributions, the red and the blue. And that's how you get a probability distribution across your clusters. I mean, your clusters would be more of a distribution. And as you know, in any distribution, the points which are on the extreme ends of the distribution have lesser probability. 
to be in that cluster. So hence Gaussian mixture model is a soft clustering because the points which are more on the outer side of a cluster visually will have lesser probability to that the, to the center of the cluster or to of being in that cluster. Okay, if you could see this GIF over here, see it starts with two distributions and try to fit it. Okay, and then later comes to a proper distribution. There is a gradient, right? The contours. So the contours is because of the probability, the decrease in probability as you go farther away from the uh, cluster center. Now, GMM is solved using a technique called expectation maximization. There are many other techniques. This is the simplest way one could have explained expectation maximization. This is a very uh, technical thing, but simply it's a two-step process. In one step, you try to uh, calculate the expectation. Okay, uh, Expectation is something called the probability of that point to be in cluster. Cluster so one, cluster two, cluster three. So let's say if you have k clusters, or uh, then what is the probability of point being in all the clusters for given model parameters? So how do you calculate probabilities if you have been given mean, variance, and component weights? Okay, then how you can calculate the probabilities? The second step is called the maximization step, in which you try to maximize those probabilities because you want every point to have the maximum probability so that we know in which particular distribution that point is lying in, right? So base, if you try to maximize it, it's an iterative process. You would do the step one that helps you give, it, uh, give you the probabilities. Then in step two, you try to maximize the probabilities by changing the model parameters. Again, you get the model parameters, you calculate the probability, uh, like step one and this thing keeps going on the expectation and maximization okay so this is the most simplest way i could have explained by the way in case you really want to get into the technical uh details of it i have added a section which is called gmm algorithm explanation so this is the bias theorem which talks about the uh the objective function and what we are trying to uh, maximize the the e uh, the expectation step and the maximization step and the E step and how does it work? Okay, so you could go through it. It's it won't take time to understand it if you really understand the notations and all. Again, I have the simulated data for you. I am creating uh, blobs using you know a sample generator from SK Learn. Uh, so a blob is a random uh, sample generation. You could give number of data points, number of centers. You could actually give a uh, standard deviation as well. So just a minute, okay. Yes. So see if I uh, if I uh, this is at standard deviation zero point six. Let's read zero point eight. So the the points would be more spread out. This is a function to run GMF. Just for the sake of time, I'm just going through quickly. As you could see, the output is something like this. Okay. It tells you about the probability of each point across different clusters. And I have tried to model it here. So the smaller the size of the point, the smaller the probability of that point to lie in this cluster. The bigger the size of that point, the, the higher the probability that that point belongs to that cluster. And that is soft clustering for you. I mean, the size of the point is telling you uh, the probabilities are not about hard clustering. We don't say that this point belongs in only this cluster. Let me quickly check my. Option. Okay, so guys, uh, only five minutes left. So this is LDA. Quick, quick uh, introduction to LDA. Very strong topic. Uh, very strong technique. LDA is used for topic modeling. If you have been given documents, then you could actually document. Uh, if you you could cluster the documents into multiple parts. So one could be about politics, one could be about economics, one could be about, let's say, genetics, something like that. But again, LDA is a soft plus, right? So for each document, the output would be, okay, this document belongs to this particular topic uh, with weight of 0 0.4, while for topic two with weight of 0 0.6 and topic three with 0 0.3. And that, sum up, that sums up to one, okay? This is a very intuitive blog that I have given. Go read it. Uh, the code is there. Uh, it does it on the sample from a Kaggle dataset. Uh, 
it, it won't take much time self read techniques okay this is just for you fuzzy c means i have given the code for you hdb scan i haven't given the code but this link actually has a, a snippet this is a documentation by from the founders of hdb scan it's a it's a better algorithm than db scan by the way because db scan in which we provide epsilon and the minimum points we are actually giving a a fixed density across the feature space okay but the density of the points i mean some at some points the points would be very closely attached to each other very 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 much nearby while some it would be very far away hence to take care of the varying density hdb scan works last slide okay i'm just wrapping it up industry use cases of clustering detect natural patterns i have already talked about it this is a pre a pre processing step for supervised learning and semi supervised as well so you could cluster the data get the cluster labels and provide it as another feature in your supervised learning so that becomes another feature and actually gives you better result for supervised learning on semi supervised those cluster labels could be used as a dependent variable reduce data size that's another use case sometimes you have so many features what you do is let's say you use lda to get probability vectors that this particular topic has probability vectors of uh, of let's say 10 uh, length and then use those probability features to do hard clustering on top of it okay very interesting use case think about it anomaly detection i already told you uh, clustering techniques are able to detect noise and outliers in the data and that could be used as anomaly detection as well closing remarks before choosing a closing a technique have business understanding okay uh, it's an old trick in in active research I don't think clustering is like gone people are still researching about it it's very difficult to do and hence uh, uh, it has uh, quite a value in most of the companies as well okay these are the sources thanks to them uh, and i know i cannot take questions but yeah that's all i have thank you so much guys for this oh, uh, hi shan i think uh, if you'd like to take 10 minutes for questions it's great to go i think there are quite a few and we can extend sure. others i think 10 to 15 minutes if required uh if you can go ahead and uh, encourage these guys i think uh we're open for uh, sorry we're open for questions guys and i'd really appreciate if you guys could go ahead put, put post your questions here we'll be sharing the notebook and the entire recording within a few days no doubt i have got a quite, quite a lot of questions also a compliment to you ishan i had uh, i think anmol who said that it's a really great session we should be chance of more sessions so i think <laughs> you will be getting quite in requests <laughs> <laughs> sure sure not okay, problem uh, guys I, yeah let's take some of the questions which are on the chat if uh, i think that's important okay yep that we can do okay i'll start. Uh, just request to everyone we'll be i'm sharing a feedback form with you guys please feel free to share your thoughts about the session and if you found the session helpful and how was it overall we'll be sharing all of the feedback with ishan as well hey guys don't mind it takes uh, a small time to give feedback but that could be of a good value for me at one point uh, if you give a session definitely ask for feedback because that's how you learn in life right and that's how you grow so i would be thankful if you give feedback to me thanks a lot let me take some okay we, we could share the recorded session in youtube if it all were required the version that's up to you uh let me take some technical questions okay i told you about methane and euclidean right uh if you are talking about uh if we have to cluster uh, let's say areas or geographies then you use methane euclidean is you could if you are trying to uh capture or, the, or if you're trying to do clustering in a 2d data phase i would say do you use euclidean most of the times you use euclidean there is a cosine similarity as well that is very important please read about cosine similarity in agglomerate clustering we have n clusters to the to state the clusters we want clustering n clusters so how is k means different Yeah so as i told you in k means you have to give the number of clusters at the starting okay so that you could run it in agglomerative clustering we are creating a dendrogram without any input of number of clusters looking at a dendrogram we could actually cut it anywhere we want okay you will always get clusters but it's more about which clusters are more fine and will have less variance and that's the reason we look for that maximum distance between 
a maximum a length of the vertical line and that's where we cut it okay so that's how it is different another important point point i told you it's hierarchical clustering is very useful when you are trying to link one cluster with sub clusters and with sub sub clusters right so something like mammals and within mammals you have some animals and within those animals you have another thing like two uh, this animal got four legs while this animal got two legs something like that so if you are looking for linkage go for agglomerative how do we handle deployment of any clustering models fantastic question uh, so yes uh, clustering techniques if you are looking for some sort of a use case where you want to identify any new pattern so let's say you know that most of the times uh, the it tickets that are getting raised are of four different types so based on the text data you are able to classify okay this ticket should go to this particular group this ticket should go to this particular group but all of a sudden something new comes up okay so that's where clustering could be used that if any any new pattern comes up any new cluster comes up then it uh, raises an automatic alert or a ticket okay that is uh, a very good use case clustering can be deployed and it has been deployed many times but you need to monitor it over a period of time because at last you are looking at the historical patterns if new pat if the patterns which were not common earlier become common now then it becomes normal right it becomes just another cluster so one should not take action against those clusters now which on which you were taking action earlier so that's another way and hence you know customer segmentation its companies are making billions of dollars just or just doing customer segmentation for big brands target lowes walmart because the customer patterns purchasing patterns keep changing the demographics keep changing and the way customers respond back uh, uh, is very different so if you have uh, 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 heard about segments like millennials or uh, baby boomers so even th their patterns changes over a period of time hence clustering needs to be monitored it could be deployed but uh, it needs to be uh, monitored Uh, at the regular intervals. In LDA, how are topics decided? So in LDA, there are two models that comes into play. Uh, oops, just a minute. Okay, so there are two models. One model maps the different topics. Okay, so what are the topics? And another model models the words which should be there in those topics. uh if my i my screen is shared right just a minute you could see over here in my lda code if you go to the bottom here you have nine topics okay so one model is trying to classify the documents into uh, topics but when i say classify it's giving probability to different topics that this document belongs to this topic 40% uh, another topic 20% things like that but every topic has multiple words and weightage to it so center is 0.011 farmer ox sport marriage okay so all these the words have different weightages for that particular topic as well so that's another interesting thing how do you go about doing clustering on audio data say predicting whether child is dyslexic or not from audio uh, good question so first of all see audio data is the thing different than any other encoding or numeric encoding right how is machine interpreting the data machine doesn't know whether that's uh, that this data is coming from a cat image or a video or audio or is it text right what machine is reading is machine is just reading some numerical vectors and trying to find patterns into it one good good example is uh, this Speech to text, or uh, okay. So what Google does is, uh, they have so many recordings. Uh, let's say YouTube audio recordings, and they have so many transcripts. So they are just trying to learn a pattern, as in, if I convert this audio recording into a numerical vector, what is the functional form between those numerical vectors to this final transcript? And that's what it is learning. So machine doesn't know that it was an audio at some point of time. Machine, what what machine knows is that it's in form of a numerical encoding, and if I give this then numerical encoding, then this is the output. I hope that answers. Maybe not a very good answer, but anyways. Uh, 
which one is the best listening technique uh, all and none i mean again it's use case basis definitely things that you should uh, look into is that first of all the first thing comes into picture is uh, how big is the data because it's always about running things real time or near real time if time is not uh, a, a barrier then you, every clustering technique is open the second thing that comes into play is is it going to be hard clustering or is it going to be a soft clustering right then the third thing that's coming into play is okay uh, what kind of a clusters am i expecting or what kind of inputs i have so many times you know a business problem so in the problem that i was solving in walmart where i have to of uh, identify incorrect dimensions for different product types so one of the product type is uh, television right and people have uh, i mean the suppliers have given many incorrect dimensions now what i know is that televisions comes in all different sizes okay so you will have 16 inch 32 inch and 14 inch and 42 inch and 15 inch. so the cluster is not is definitely not going to be spherical in nature it will keep growing if you try it, i mean See, that's more of an intuition in multi-dimensional. But I was I, I was working in three-dimensional feature space, length, breadth, and height. So the cl the clusters will have different kind of shapes and not always spherical. So definitely partition-based clustering won't work there. Do I need hierarchical-based clustering? Maybe, maybe not. But the data size is so big that I want to use hierarchical-based clustering. And hence I use DB scan. Do I do I need to use probability-based clustering? No, I don't want probability whether. Uh, the dimension looks 60% wrong while 40% it looks correct i want to uh, uh, an upstate answer that is the dimension incorrect or correct and hence the db scan is one of the option or hdb scan so these are the two algorithms that i try so that's how you choose a clustering technique as I said if you have a spherical cluster kind of addition then k means for a smiley face uh, db scan and so on and so forth how do we scale? I, I I didn't get it. Admol, uh, yeah. I, uh, how do we scale clustering algorithms across machines, and if possible on GPUs? Hmm. Good question. Uh, by the way, in the code that I have uh, given you for LDA, I have used uh, their feature of using multiple cores. But let me let me get back to, on this question because i am not sure so i don't want to give a wrong answer but that's a very good question i'll take a note and i'll definitely uh, send it across the doc uh, other documents i'm using a speech a speech recognition library in jupyter for the same how to proceed once i have ideal paragraph and child's reading translated into words fantastic yeah so what you're saying is that you want to convert audio to text once and once you have text which means words the next step should be converting those words into some kind of a numerical representation so uh, if you talk about uh, natural language processing which is nlp the words could be converted into numerical representation through multiple techniques the most simple the simple technique is that you remove all the small words or the words which are very common and then you use only the important ones and then you create a count of it right that in this particular document, this particular word came twice, this particular word came twice. That's the basic one. Then comes uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency, which is TF-IDF, right? Then comes language models, okay? So like word to vec So word to vec is very common. So I think you should start with word to vec It converts every word into a numerical vector of 300 length long, okay? And the way it is converting is, so let's say you have two words, king and queen, and then you have a numerical representation for king and queen. If you subtract the two, the, the vector that would be coming out after subtraction should be very much similar to the vector of a men, because that's the difference between king and a queen, right, more or less. So that's how it works. It, it groups the words that way. So I hope that helps. So I start with word to vec, there's sentence to vec, there's paragraph to vec, uh, pa uh, paragraph to vec as well. I'm building chatbot for my company, so I have developed my own ML model, but I am facing many problems in deploy. Is there any simple deployment process or I should use 
See, this is a very different question. Uh, it's not related to the topic, but if you want to talk about chatbot, uh, uh, email that to email me your question. Okay, I think that would help. What are thought clusters? Uh, sorry, Admiral, I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, is there any other question, guys? By the way, for the people for for whom I have not answered your questions, please email that to me. Maybe I have intentionally uh, missed it. Uh, I'm just kidding. But by the way, if I have missed it, your questions, please email that to me, and I'll get back to you for sure. Okay. Okay, guys. So, Varsha, I think uh, we can close it here. What What are your thoughts? I think, uh, yeah, that sounds cool. You've taken extra time, no doubt. And Anmol is also saying thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Anmol, for uh, letting us know about your thoughts. Please do fill the feedback form to everyone. I'll just keep it open for two more minutes so that people can access the link. Uh, I want to thank you, Ishan, for a wonderful session. And I'm sure uh, the entire gang of participants have taken a lot from this session. And... Uh, I am hoping to see more LinkedIn requests <laughs> coming towards you. Okay. Sure. And uh, I think uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thanking you on behalf of the entire team of Grey Atom and the, all the participants who joined today. And we hope to see more sessions coming soon. So uh, please feel free to give your suggestions to all the guys. And uh, I wanted to encourage everyone to you know come up with more questions next time if required. I know we are not... Uh, we do not have a lot of time in the 90 minute session, but yes, we keep on having more of such. Also, uh, yeah, I think that we will be sharing the notebook within uh, probably the next week itself. Uh, we'll be emailing it to you. So as, along with the recording and uh, yes, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Log on to Grey Atom's learning platform to unlock more free content. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates.